there's so much going on in the world around us. Uh, the conversation, the talk, back and forth. What do we What do we know? What do we understand? And Dad and I are here just to talk a little bit about those things as as we see them, right? Absolutely. So uh, I want to I, I, our our topic today is humanism on steroids. <laughs> um, we we talked about the smoke screen yesterday and and just all the stuff that you see in the the news and and the news feeds the constant just barrage of good and evil and the war of good and evil. Um, that's the smoke screen sitting on top. What lies underneath is more sinister. Absolutely. It really is, isn't it? Yep. They even call it the deep state in politics. <laughs> right. You know, so they know there's one there. They just, <laughs> they can't figure out, I guess, who they are. You have men of great wealth uh, setting things in motion. You've had, you know, I, I saw this again in a biography piece the other day I was watching, but Dad's made mention of this for years. And, and I saw this on a biography piece. Most people don't realize these things in history unless you've went and looked. But it was, you know, uh, the American Civil War, North against South, the aggression, whatnot. The, the, the American Civil War was funded by one English bank. Yep. And the, Both sides. Yeah, the House of Rothschilds. And he says this. This is a famous quote by uh, the... Baron von Rothschild, he says, he says, let me control the monetary, uh, the, the money of a country, and I care not its politics. Um, it was one son for the South and another son for the North. And, you know, so that seems awfully nefarious to me. <laughs> well, they won either way, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it's so, just money. We don't care. <laughs> So to me, all these things, this is what lies underneath all the stuff that we talk about on top, that we're fighting the war of good and evil. They're the bad guys. We're the good guys. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. What I said. Everybody's still eating from, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yep. Today, we're talking a little bit about some things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this again. Genesis 11.6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one. One. And they have all one language. Language is not just what's the word you hear coming out of my mouth, but the thought that generates the word. It's all one thing. Language, when, when Jehovah confounded the language, it was more than just changing dialects. That was part of it. Oh, yeah. But it was changing the thinking and the way they thought. It, it, it goes to a greater, greater thought process, folks. And this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Okay. You know, we read these things, we have this small <clears throat> snippet of that. And how do we understand that within context? I think you have to look at history throughout and men in our time and different things to really understand what's going on because this thought process has been there for a long time. We've had to overcome language. Language is one of the greatest barriers uh, for mankind uh, there is, right? Absolutely. If you don't believe that, go to a foreign country where they don't speak English and you understand and speak none of their language and see how easy it is to get along. And not only that, the cultural norms. Yes. Culturally, you do different things than they do. They do different things than you do. The way they eat, the patterns of life. I remember we were in Mexico on numerous occasions, and, you know, everybody came home at 2 o'clock, ate dinner. It was siesta, 2 to 5. Came home, took a nap, went back to work, stayed open till 8, 9, nine. o'clock. Yeah in their stores and then came home. That was, that's not what we do here. No, that's not American culture. That's that type. That's their culture. Well, it's interesting because one, one of my interpreters one time uh, said this to me and it, it really impressed me because I had never thought of it. He said, now Bobby says, when you preach, don't use any kind of humor. 
And uh, I thought about that because often you'll use humor in something mm-hmm. to make a point. Right. He said, they won't understand you. And it dawned on me. You know, there's, there's humor in every country, but it's not the same. And they wouldn't even understand my kind of humor. They, no. they had no comprehension no of it. No point of so, reference. No, there's no point of reference. So, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting thing. I, I agree, and it's and we've talked a lot about those things in 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 that yes. traveling in and out. Yeah. So let's look at a few things here, folks, from this. And when you're looking at culture and things like this, I want to go back to a particular individual. This is in the 19th century. The Enlightenment period, the Enlightenment that came into the culture of the world really started this thought process, really started what we're going to talk about, and humanism on steroids. It was the beginning. There was a lot of men talking about this. Uh, The United States of America, and I've said this and I will continue to say it, I know this is not the popular opinion. Okay, fine, you can disagree with me. It's up to you. But the Constitution is not a Christian document. Our country was not founded on Christian principles. Our country was founded on Enlightenment principles. The documents that were written were written by Enlightenment thinkers. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Thomas Paine. All of these men were Enlightenment thinkers and influenced heavily by men like John Locke, Montesquieu, Voltaire. Uh, Thomas Jefferson even used John Locke's um, statement about Um, being endowed by our creator. He just didn't care what your creator was. That's all Jefferson was concerned about. When we look at the Constitution, it's devoid of really any religion, and it says it implicit or explicitly to separate religion from government. And the Constitution is a document, in my opinion, that gave mankind a real true ability to separate itself from religion, from God, period. Then you saw it in later, later writings as it came through, and then you saw Marxism come into being and all these things. Well, let's go back real quick and look at something. Everybody's heard of Frederick Nietzsche, I would imagine, I would hope. And the famous statement, God is dead. Well, when we say this, most people don't really know what he actually said, do they? No, because we're too superficial. Yes. We won't go look for ourselves. No, but this is, I'm going to read you the quote from Nietzsche and what he actually said. He said, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves? The murderers of all murderers. What was holiest and mightiest of all? that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our own knives. Who will wipe this blood off of us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? See, the statement actually says that we have destroyed him. And this is what the Enlightenment brought in to bear. It was the first attempt for man to come back to this idea that we just read in the Genesis narrative. The people are one. Because Nimrod was a mighty hunter against the Lord. That's what the the name Nimrod means. Mighty hunter against Lord. Jehovah. Yep. Nietzsche's statement is explicit in the same fashion, wouldn't you agree? Well, absolutely. And if you and if you listen to that, he's not necessarily saying that I believe God is dead. No. Or that I I'm telling you God is dead. No. No, he's saying this is what mankind has done. <laughs> and now what are we going to do? Right. And he says we're murderers. We're murderers of all murderers. How do we clean ourselves? How do we clean? How do, how do we have, <laughs> what, what festivals are we going to invent to cleanse ourselves? Well, we've got a lot of holidays. Yes. You know, and I guess that's what we did. I don't know. But uh, 
You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. I've said many times, don't just listen to what I say. Go check it out. Right. I do. I don't just listen to people. I go check it out. We're a soundbite generation. I, I never saw the like in my life. Somebody gets on television, says two words, and everybody goes, oh, my goodness. Look at, oh. And <laughs> it could be a lie. It could be, uh, you know, <laughs> nothing. But we just take what we hear, and right. we don't check nothing out. We don't read anymore. We don't study. We don't go look back. And, and you should because of this. Right. You just heard what he actually said. And see, then you have to understand, this is coming from a man that is in the 19th century, and from the 17th century through the 18th and 19th century, humanism, enlightenment thinking was the rage, and deism became a very popular th thought process. It did. Um, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, I think even Benjamin Franklin, they held to these thought <clears throat> processes. Deism is an idea that we do have a creator, that there is a being that created everything, but once he created it, he left us to our own design. Whatever we could do, morally, yeah. this, that, and whatever the case. Well, this is, the, this is what we're seeing, and humanism on steroids is what we've seen in this Great Reset. If, you ta if you've taken a moment from yesterday and looked at the link that was down below in the show post, and, I'm, and it's there again today, go look. What's happening from the World Economic Forum, what these men are talking about, how they're trying to bring humanity, and what transhumanism is. All you have to do is go to Google and type in, what is transhumanism? Started in the early 90s and has moved through. It's the idea of man living autonomously without any kind of thought process of a creator of any religion whatsoever, basically. And this, we're right back to this idea that sat with Nimrod and these people that Jehovah, and there's been two cataclysmic events on the earth, the flood and the confounding of the language. It was cataclysmic, yep. dispersed man throughout the, the earth, because Jehovah was not going to allow him to reimagine himself in whatever he believed he was going to be. No. Well, look at what you just read in Genesis. The statement there is they're of all one language and they're all one. One. Yeah. They had one purpose, one idea, and so forth. What are they trying to do in the world today? They're trying to bring it back to that condition. They're trying to make everybody one. One in politics, one in thought. Uh, look at what's going on in our government right now. If you have an opposing opinion, if you have a dissenting opinion then they're after you. They want you to uh, resign. They want to kick you out. We have a couple of senators right now under siege because they don't agree with them. Well, I thought that uh, they were the party of uh, crossing the aisle, and I heard uh, Mr. Biden say, well, you know, let's just all get together, and, and we need unity. Well, yeah, as long as you agree with them, you can have unity, but if you don't, look out because they're, they're going to come and get you. Right, exactly. Exactly. And see, you have to understand, folks, go look, go, go, go look into history at, at some of these men from John Locke to Voltaire to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau to Montesquieu. Um, you go back through these names and you see the ideas of Jefferson. You see the ideas of our country. You see what the United States, the United States of America is a country founded with the express purpose of divorcing ourselves from Jehovah, from Christianity, from any type of religion, so that we that they would be free from those bound, uh, those those that those um, bonds. We'll put it that way. Here's something Nietzsche wrote. He said. Um, uh, Nietzsche thought that belief in God made us cringing, cowardly, submissive creatures, and profoundly unfree. He believed we would continue to be so until we accepted our place in nature. No easy feat in an age so steeped in God, think. When will we be done with our caution and care, Nietzsche wondered. When will, we, when will all these shadows of God no longer darken us? When will we have completely 
de-deified nature? When will we begin to naturalize humanity with a pure, newly discovered, newly redeemed nature? And I think it's interesting to uh, mention how he became and what happened to him and how he died. Uh, it's terrible, Dad. Yeah. Lot, he went insane. Yeah, he was insane. If, you, if you've read about Nietzsche, you understand. Even his sister, where he lived, he, he came back, he was living with his sister. His mind was gone. And she was allowing people to pay to walk into her house and stare at him, sitting in a corner because he couldn't think. He was, his mind was gone. Yeah. Think of that. Become a public spectacle. Yes. Hey, look, we can sit here and say what we want to, but the wages of sin, the wages of missing the mark... Is death. Is death. How, pl- how much plainer does it get? But yet we continually want to walk away. We want to reimagine ourselves. This is what it was from the garden. Hath Jehovah said. Did he say? Uh, yes. Yes, he did. And this is the point. And we are not willing to accept that understanding of our created self, who we were created to be. We're constantly trying to reimagine ourselves, reposition ourselves. And the reason we're seeing what we're seeing in the world today is because it's humanism on steroids, transhumanism, the Great Reset, all these things trying to move ourselves into this thinking that we can be autonomous, that we can make ourselves by our own strength, we can live for eternity and move there, right? Well, yeah, they actually believe, you know, I've seen a lot of science fiction movies uh, (laughs) portray this, but they actually believe that they're going to be able to transfer their consciousness into a robot. Yes. And the robot will have their mind, even if their flesh body dies, they will continue on, as I've seen in in a couple of movies. Uh, I don't really know how they're going to do that, uh, but uh, that's what they believe. So, you know, it's, it always amazes me. They talk about uh, believers in, in, in Jehovah as being, uh, oh, how, how should I put it, uh, kind of unrealistic in the way we believe, you know. Mm-hmm. You really believe that? You really believe that that's going to happen? Yeah, is it any harder than believing that you can put your brain in, in a robot? Uh no, right. uh, in fact, it's easier for me to believe what I believe than what they talk about. So, uh, man has been on a quest since Adam, since the deception was first done. He's been on a quest to raise himself up to a godlike level, and he's never going to make it. He's never going to do it. Uh, we are who we are. We are who Jehovah made us. And if we would be content with that and just worship the, the Lord and everything, you know, I, I don't know what the Lord would do. He'd probably set up his kingdom here on the earth and then we could walk into it. But uh, we're not willing to do that. You know, not only Nietzsche, but, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you look at Karl Marx, both of his daughters committed suicide. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, how come? He had the answer. He had the answer for the world. He had the right. answer for government. He had the answer for everything. Well, then how come they killed themselves? Dad's got the answer, right? You know, I don't, I don't get it. I, <laughs> well, and to your point, you know, Nietzsche said, "Must we ourselves not become God simply to appear worthy of what we've done?" Yes, right. See, yes. and that's the point of it. That was what you will become as Jehovah. You will be your own strength. You will live by your own right hand. Yep. This is his point. That's it's the same thing, folks. And if you think they haven't read the book, you're wrong. Here's from the, yeah. <laughs> They've read the Bible. Here's from the um, uh, transhumanism.org. Max Moore in 1990 wrote this, one of the first uh, developers of transhumanism. He says, transhumanism is a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life-promoting principles and values. That's transhumanism. I didn't see anything mention of Jehovah or anything like that in there. 
nothing of Jesus Christ, nothing of anything of that nature. This is where, this is what's underneath all the stuff you see, all the war, all the rumors of wars, all the fighting of the knowledge of good and evil, all the bang, bang, bang. This is what's happening underneath. Be prepared. And I understand, I know, and I'm going to say this again because I want people to understand and see these things. We look at our country, the one we live in. We're, we're, we're uh, citizens of the United States of America, natural born that way. And we will, how could this, we're, we're a Christian nation. No. See, that again sits on top. It was never about that. I know there were people that came here that were believers in Jehovah and believed well, yes. in those things and had principles. Yes. Sure they were. That's true. But the framers of this had no intention of doing that. How else could it end up in what? We, we just, this just happened? No. It was intentional. It's always been intentional. Mankind is moving himself further away from Jesus, further away from the Creator, as they possibly can in order to create for themselves what they want to do, and stand up and say, we have achieved peace, we've achieved safety, we have achieved our own existence. That's where this is going. Pay attention to what's happening, because this is where we are right now. Well, it's always been curious to me. They talk about all this stuff, you know, let's just all get along, and let's all do this and do that, and yeah. As I said before, uh, but if you don't if you don't agree with them, then they're willing to kill half the population of the world just to get it done. So tell me how they really want to help out mankind, how much they love people, how much they care. They don't care one whit about anybody but themselves. Unless you're willing to go along with their program. Right. And if you're willing to glad hand them, pat them on the yeah. back, tell them how great they are then yeah, you're going to be a good old boy. Yeah, exactly. But if you disagree or if you, and, and you don't mean, disagreement doesn't mean hatred. Disagreement doesn't mean that I'm judging anybody. Disagreement doesn't mean anything like that. I, I, that's why I get so tired, see, language. Yeah. If you disagree, then, you know, no, I disagree. I, I, can, I can love you and disagree with you. I can care for you and disagree with you. I don't understand why people can't figure that out. <laughs> well, if, if you don't agree with them, then you hate them. No, I don't. No. I just think sometimes what people do are, is wrong. Yeah. I can love a murderer and disagree with his act. <laughs> Jehovah, isn't that what it is? Yes. Right? For God so loved the world. And, the, and when he said the world, there was a lot of stuff in it. There's a lot of folks doing what they wasn't supposed to do. It isn't God's will, the Bible says, any man perish. God loves us. But he won't put up with our disobedience. Amen. I loved my children, but I didn't put up with disobedience. Do you love your children? Do you care? Do you put up with their disobedience? No. No. You, do you disagree with your children? At times, yeah, severely. But do you, do you hate them? See, I don't understand why we can't figure that out. It's simple. It's simple. Yeah. But if you disagree, if you have any disagreement today, then you're a heretic, a you're, you're uh, an evil person, you're bad, uh, you ought to be put somewhere and locked up or shot or whatever, you know. It just amazes me. Well, let's finish today with this, because Dad's talked a lot about this. And I'm going to say, because to what he put, just as he's finishing there, be careful what you agree with. Absolutely. What you sit your right hand out to, and you mark your hand, you mark your forehead, you mark your brain, your mind. You accept things because it always isn't just about something written physically on no. you, folks. No. Are there trying to do physical things in the earth? Yeah, and I think yeah. those are things that are part of it. But if you stick your hand out and, and agree, if you agree with your hand and reach out and agree, and you assent with your mind to agree with this world, what mark is that? Jesus, The Lord said He will write His name. He will write their laws and the inner parts and His name in their mind. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the mark. The mark of the covenant is that anointing, that mind of Jehovah Absolutely. in agreement with him. Understand that. Know what's going on, right? Absolutely. This is what we're facing right now, folks. This is what we're facing. So I hope you enjoyed that today. If you did, again, please 
throw us a like, throw a comment down. A lot of big topics here. We'd love to talk with you about that. Share this out with your friends. Everybody. Let's have a discussion. Exactly. Right, Dad? Yes. Have a discussion. Everybody have a great day in the Lord. And always remember to give love, give life, and and give give Jesus. Jesus.